Welcome to the Garden Angeles, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. This is episode number 48. I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana. And I'm Dee Nash from Guthrie, Oklahoma. Good morning, Dee. Good morning, Carol. How's it going? It's all wonderful. We have a lot to talk about today. Oh my goodness, yes. We better get started, huh? You want to do the quote or do you want me to do the quote? I will do the quote. For man, autumn is a time of harvest, of gathering together. For nature, it is a time of sowing, of scattering abroad. Edwin Way Teal. Boy, there's truth in that. So I harvested some figs this week. You did? Yes. Guess what I harvested too? What? I harvested tomatillos, tomatoes, and the last of the peppers. Nice. I also harvested, um, of the peppers, I harvested jalapenos, and I also did another kind of pepper that, for the life of me, I cannot remember the name of. And I have a ton of peppers to pick, so I will pick a peck of pickled peppers pretty soon. Fun. The other thing is the sowing is true. I've got to pull a bunch of weeds or seeds of weeds will be scattered about my garden and I will never recover it. Well, I have a weed in my garden that is trying to take over and I need to work on that this week. But I also have two talks this weekend that I got to finish, you know, proofing and getting ready. So who knows what will happen? Exactly. It's just, it's kind of like it's nice weather, but there's a lot of things to do. But somehow we'll get out there. But we got a couple of updates from our last podcast. Our friend Lanny DeMerchant clued us into something about Plant Skid because you and I have never used it before. And we talked about it in our last podcast. And she contacted us because she's a listener too. And she said, just remember that it's made from blood, from dried blood. So your dog's going to want to dig up anything that you use it on. And since I have some type of a bloodhound that lives at my house... Um, Plant skin may be an issue, but I'm going to give it a try. And she suggested that you also put neem oil on the bulbs in addition to the plant skid to kind of deter the blood smell for animals. Something to think about. That is a good idea. And my sister has a new dog, uh, Remy, and she found out why the dog spent a year in a shelter and kept getting returned. The dog has dug to China in their yard. Ugh. So I'll have to warn her not to put that out there. She said, the dog is really happy, but the dog is digging a lot. And I says, well, you've got places to plant trees now. Well, there you go. <laughs> Always a positive outlook, Carol. Always a positive outlook. Always a positive outlook. So guess what else, Dee? What? I went to a used book sale this past weekend and I got some books about chrysanthemums. You did. You found, you know, chrysanthemums used to be one of the most popular flowers that were, like I said, that was grown, one of, was grown. And so I'm not surprised you found some old books on chrysanthemums. Tell me about them. So I have the Pictorial Practical Chrysanthemum Culture. Pictorial Practical Chrysanthemum Culture. That's a mouthful. By Walter Wright. It's from 1904. Ooh, wow. And the interesting thing about it is... It's obviously black and white pictures, but they have some black and white pictures in the back of those really old fashioned moms. You know, the great big ones like you and I talked about would be used for homecoming um, spider moms, corsages. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, they just have beautiful and just reminds you that, you know, no one's growing these and they're disappearing from culture. So that was that was a great find. Um, Our friend Matt Mattis, you know, the reason people grew those so much back then is that they displayed and showed them at chrysanthemum shows. And our friend Matt yes. Mattis, um, he grows mums for competition. So there are some places still in the United States where they actually have mum competitions. Because I know he's, he's posted cool. on his blog before about, um, about growing those and about displaying them. And you have to type, there are a lot of work to, to display and to compete, you have to tie the stems as they grow because they have those really long floral stems, and they're just a lot of yes. work. Tell me about your next book. So, well, we need to link to Matt's blog so people can see that. Yeah, I'll see if I can look up that post because that was a good one. The next book that I bought 
was the Handbook of Japanese Herbs and Their Uses, and it's from 19, I think it's from 1968. Cool. A lot of times it's hard to find the dates on these things. But they have a whole article about, you'll never believe this, some notes on cooking chrysanthemums. Really? Ew. Really? Yeah. So the author says that during World War II, when food was scarce, the Japanese created a lot of varieties of chrysanthemums just for culinary purposes. And he said at first he didn't like them, but as he continued to eat them, kind of the taste grew on him. Mm-hmm. But, uh, and I sent this to our friend Ellen Zakos, a copy of this article, and she thought it was interesting, too. I don't think she had thought about eating chrysanthemums, and I'm not going to recommend it either. I don't. I mean, but, which, which part do you eat? The Like the petals? The, the flowers. But not the whole flower, right? You pick off petals, surely. Petals. I'm yeah. sure. I'm sure. I didn't look at the actual recipes. Uh, yeah, you. it's the separate the florets from the flower head. After briefly boiling and cooling, season them with a mixture of soy sauce, vinegar, and sugar. Ew. Then they are ready to add to sliced raw fish as a garnish. Carol is not eating any of that. <laughs> that just sounds disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, here's what's interesting. Here's the interesting part. So apparently there's a Chinese herbal books, 52 volumes, called the Hanso Kumuko, okay. published in 1590. They have a formula for using chrysanthemums to increase your life. You ready? <laughs> okay. What's that? I'm going to tell you what. You gather the young shoots in March, the leaves in June, the flowers in September, and the stems and roots in December, each on a certain day of the sexagenary cycle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that has sexagenary. I looked it up at 60 years. I, okay. Dry all those parts of the plant in the shade for 100 days. Powder and mix an even quantity of each on a dog day of the sexagenary cycle. I don't even know when a dog day would be. <laughs> don't either. Take a small spoonful of the mixture three times a day. If the dosage is con- continued for 100 days, one becomes nimble and generous, and one's white hairs turn black within a year. If the dosage is cont- continued for two years, new teeth will grow where the old ones fell out. <laughs> In the fifth year, an old man of 80 will become like a boy again. Okay. <laughs> That's complicated because we, oh my sexagenary <laughs> is like a 60-year cycle. Right. So I think they made the instructions complicated. So no matter what you did, when it obviously wouldn't work, they could say, you didn't follow the instructions. <laughs> you didn't do it right. <laughs> so that was my uh, mom finds. I'll tell you about my other finds later. Okay, sounds good. But we aren't really talking about mums today. We're, this is just an update, kind of like an old business. We'll call it old business yes. corner. It's the old yes. business corner of the garden. It's where you plunk everything that you don't know what to do with it. It's like a holding place for plants. Right, or we could just call it a compost pile because sometimes it's like you just want that stuff to rot and go away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk about this week's flower. Continuing with our... Our bulb episode, which was last time, which was all about deer-resistant, critter-resistant, vole-resistant bulbs, this time we're going to talk about a bulb that plant that animals love to eat. We're going to talk about crocuses. Yes, and we love them because they're early bloomers. Right, and for our listeners, technically, the bulb is actually called a corm on a crocus. It's slightly different than a bulb, but we're going to use the words corms and bulb interchangeably right because that's we just don't have time for that we don't want to confuse it (laughs) so the bulbs that people go to the store and buy yeah 99 times out of 100 are the big hybrid crocuses right which aren't that big no they're not that big i mean really they aren't that big i mean you think hybrid tulip and that's big right but a hybrid crocus isn't that big i mean it's not going to show up from far far away but it is bigger than the other type of crocus. Right. So my favorite, what's your favorite hybrid crocus, Dee? I I know mine right off the bat. I don't have a favorite hybrid crocus. You just haven't lived enough. I mostly, I mostly, (laughs) 
I mostly just grow the old-fashioned ones. What's your favorite? My favorite is a variety called Pickwick, which is a Uh white and purple striping. And to me, that is just a beautiful flower in the springtime. And I have literally bought these by the hundreds because they are so pretty. Well, let's just say right off the bat that you grow a lot more crocus than I do. A lot. I mean, when I say a lot more, I mean like multitudinously more crocus. That's not even a word, but whatever. You grow a lot more. So I started trying to grow them in the lawn. And what happened to my crocus, Carol? In the lawn? I think cr- yes. critters ate them. Yes, voles came and dug up my lawn and made a total mess. I don't have a huge lawn. I have what I call a lawnette. And it's my little lawn that, of uh, grass that's right in front of my house. And it's actually the only lawn that does well for, it's a fescue lawn. So it does well for crocus because it's green at the same time as the crocus are. If you live in Oklahoma and you tried to plant crocus in a Bermuda lawn, how pretty would that be? I don't know. I don't know anything about Bermuda lawns. Okay, well, let me explain Bermuda lawn real quick because this has to do with what you're going to talk about. Are you ready? Yes. Bermuda lawns are flipping brown and look dead until about mm, April. So April, late April. That's not going to be a very attractive scene to see crocuses coming up in a sea of brown grass. It's ugly. So I only grew them in my fescue lawn, and then all of a sudden I had tunnels all through my fescue lawn. So I kind of gave up that dream of growing them there, but I've grown them in other places, and I'm going to put mine. I'm going to put plant skid on mine this year. Because I did order a few. Oh, I just saw a monarch outside the window. I'm sorry, I got distracted. Boy, you're easily distracted. So if you want to plant them in your lawn, the variety to plant is a species called Crocus tomasiniensis. Tomasiniensis. Or Tommies. Tommies. Yeah, Tommies. I've grown Tommies. I do have a favorite Tommy. Which is? Ruby Giant. Yes, Ruby Giant is a very beautiful one. It's sort of a pinkish purple. Yeah, it's gorgeous. It's like luminescent in partial shade. It is so pretty. So the species crocus, like the Tommies, I tell people that the corm is about the size of your thumb tip, the the first notch of your thumb. That's about the size. Right. They're tiny. The hybrid crocus corms are about twice that size. They're about the size, if you took like five... Or six quarters and stacked them up. That's the size of a hybrid, uh, yeah, hybrid crocus. Exactly. So I buy the Tommies, and I usually buy 500 or 1,000 to plant in my lawn. And so people ask me about voles, and I'm sure that I have had them dug up by voles because occasionally I have sea voles out there. But if you plant 1,000 or 500 and you do that every year for like 10 years, the chances of them eating every single one are pretty nil. In my suburban yard. In your yard, yeah. Our friend Gail might not agree with you. No. Gail Eichelberger from, (laughs) from, (laughs) she might not agree. She's from Tennessee. And she has, like I, she has a partially shaded area that she grows hers in. And she has lost a lot of them. Yes. And so that is a concern for some people. But I tell people, you know, I plant so many, I really think the voles are not going to keep up. Okay. And I also think because yours is in full sun, I think that has something to do with it. There's nothing scientific about my feeling on this, but I noticed that voles are a huge problem in shadier, in, I I will say it this way, in my shadier parts of my garden, that's where I have trouble with voles. I don't have as much trouble in the sunny parts. Don't ask me why. And I think you might be right. And here would be my hypothesis on that because I have some semi shaded areas and I have mostly sunny areas. And I do notice a little bit more digging in the semi-shaded areas. And my thought on that is the ground in those areas stays a little bit moister and softer than the ground in the full sun. And so it's easier for the voles to dig in that soil. So you may be right on that. Crummy creatures. Exactly. And I have, um, and I forget whether I ordered 500 or 1,000, but they haven't arrived yet. Let me guess. I bet you ordered 1,000. It could be. They haven't arrived yet. And then I think, oh, i got to plant all those. And it's pretty easy. I just stab the ground with a very narrow trowel called a rockery trowel. I just stab Mm -hmm. the ground, pull the trowel back, 
put the little corn behind it, pull it up, pat it, and move on. And I can, once I get my rhythm going, I can go pretty fast. Okay, so is a rockery trowel the same thing as a crocus trowel? I've never seen a crocus trowel. Long, does it have a... Does it have a long kind of tube and it's really small and yes. you pull it? Okay, so we'll link to one of those because I know where you can buy them. And then that way we can link to it in our show notes. Okay, very good. So there are a couple other spring blooming crocuses. And Dee, you got all excited about a crocus called Orange Monarch. I did because it looks so pretty in the catalog. And I fell for it last year. Very pretty. I ordered a hundred of them. And then this little tiny crocus came up, and it was more yellowy than orange. And because of the area I'd planted it in, I knew that's the only thing it could be. And, I mean, it almost bloomed flat to the ground. It didn't have any, like, stem at all. It was just flat to the ground. Okay, so this this gives us an opportunity to talk about catalog porn and how the pictures are taken, you know, so that it makes things look ideal. Um, that's done a lot in daylilies. It's also done a lot, apparently, in bulbs. Um, because here's the deal. In the catalog, it looks purple and orange, which are two of my favorite colors together. And you're telling me, I actually saw the picture because you sent me one. Um, that's not a very pretty crocus. I'm very disappointed. So. Yeah. And um, I, I don't know. So I, they'll, they'll be out there until they're not out there, but because they come back every year. But I was really disappointed. So people don't fall for catalog porn. If you see something that you really like and you think it's going to be absolutely gorgeous in your uh, lawn or in your beds, talk to somebody else who gardens too or go to our blogs and search for things because we talk about it when things don't turn out exactly the way we expected them to. Right. And then there's another. I have, um, there are heirloom crocuses out there and Old House Gardens, whom we love, has a lot of heirloom crocuses. Yes, and I ordered one. It's a deep, deep, dark purple. And I've had I've grown this one. And it is this yeah. the crocus of the unfortunate name? Yes, this is a crocus that is from like the 1920s. It has so I always call it the crocus with the unfortunate name. It's like Prince, or the artist formerly known as Prince. So this is the crocus that we consider formerly known as Negro Boy, because we hate this name. Yes, we hate the name, but once it has its name, apparently you can't rename it. You can't just change it. But it is gorgeous. It is one of the prettiest crocuses I've ever seen in my life. And it is the darkest, deepest, kind of blue-purple. And it's big. I mean, at least mine were kind of big. Yeah, it almost shimmers a little bit with a little bit of a silvery cast to the dark purple. I mean, it is royal purple. Gorgeous. Yeah, it's a beautiful color. It reminds me, it has the same luminescence that Ruby Giant has in the Tommies. You know what I'm yes. saying? That luminescent yes. quality. So it is worth buying. Just, we well, just are going to call it the crocus with the unfortunate name. Yes. And then for people who like crocuses, there's another old variety, um, which I haven't grown this one. It's called Snow Bunting. It's from 1914, also Old House Gardens. Have you grown that one? Is it pretty? I have. It is gorgeous. It's very, very small um, because, you know, it's an old heirloom crocus. But it has, If I, and I'm trying to remember exactly because I haven't planted it in a while because crocuses don't stay in my garden for long periods of time. They might last five years and then they're gone but this one opens really really early and um, one of our favorite writers of all time wrote about this crocus and that's one of the reasons I grew it if I remember right the edges of the petals have almost a purple quality at the bottom almost a brown and then it opens to snow snow white it is one of the prettiest and it smells good too because some crocuses have scent and so when you say one of our favorite writers of all time you're of course talking about Elizabeth Lawrence Yes, we love Elizabeth Lawrence. In Charlotte, North Carolina, you can still go see her gardens. Yes, she can. We've both been there and we love them. They're beautiful. So before this podcast goes live and they just, you know, wonder why they sold out a snow bunting, I'm going to go order snow bunting. (laughs) You better order it fast because I'm not kidding. I think people will go buy it. So I'm going to read what she said about it. She said, if I could only have one crocus, it would be this. She praised its pearly buds opening in January in Raleigh because she lived in both Raleigh and Charlottesville. Um, its golden throat and its delightful, strong, and musk-like fragrance. 
And it does really well in the north, and it also does well in the south. It runs from 4A to 7B. Um, it is a beautiful little crocus, and it does open very early. So I think you should add some to your lawn. Well, a, a crocus like that, I might actually put it near the front door where I'm more likely to see it when it opens early. Yeah, you could put it. In fact, you you know, one of the best ways I've grown crocus is in a pot. Yeah, I haven't grown them much in pots. Um, they're a great way to grow them. And then um, if you have enough soil in there and you let, this, let them die back down naturally and keep them watered, then you can plant them in the lawn or wherever. But you can smell it right by your house or you can force it inside. True that. There are two other crocuses. D, we're going to switch to fall. Oh, yeah. I've, only, I've tried this. It didn't work for me, but I'm, I'm excited to hear about yours. So crocus autumnal is an autumn flowering crocus, and the species name autumnal is a dead giveaway. I tell people that it's a fall flowering plant. Right. And uh, you can get purple, white. I mostly have purple and white, but I have fall flowering crocus. And in my garden, they tend to bloom um, later in October. And nice. so I almost think that they've died out, and then around Halloween I see them popping up here and there. Yeah, I've had absolutely no luck with autumnal crocus at all. Um, I have seen them flowering, though. I saw them when I was in the Pacific Northwest one winter. They yes, and they, yeah, they're very pretty, and I put those in flower beds. I don't put those in my lawn. No. And then this other one I've actually grown in my vegetable garden, and that is crocus sativus, which is the saffron crocus from whence... Which is where saffron comes from. Yes. Yeah. And so I tell people in my talks that if you would like to get rich, grow saffron crocus because, you know, a little tiny bottle of it at the grocery store is like $20 and you don't get much. No, you don't. You so don't. You, you order up some crocuses and you grow your own. Now you have to pay and for the bulbs. Yeah, you do. And it's a lot of hand picking, which is why saffron crocus, saffron is so expensive in the stores is because it all has to be hand picked. And each little crocus only has two threads, right? Three threads, I think. Three threads. Okay, three threads. That makes sense. So, uh, no. <laughs> well, and I've also, I've done research on this, D. So a pound okay. of saffron is runs about $2,000 wholesale. Wow. And you know how many crocuses you need to make a pound? No telling. 70,000. Oh, is that all? <laughs> yes. And then you have to hand pick them in the morning just after the dew is dried. And then you got to pick those threads off. The three, the three stamens have to come off and you got to make right. sure those are dry. So you, you do that. You be rich. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. <laughs> Not planning to do that anytime soon. Um, but that we should say that saffron is used to flavor lots of dishes as a subtle flavor. And it also is really beautiful and it makes everything really yellow. Yes, like saffron rice. Yeah, it's used a lot in Indian cuisine. So um, a wonderful thing to have and it tastes a lot better than turmeric, which is and, also used. And you know what I did, Dee? This is, I don't know if it's funny or not, but there's... Out in front around this one tree, I have a lot of uh, Tommies that come up in the spring. And right. my neighbors made a comment that when they see the Tommies, that's usually when they head down to Florida to go to spring training for some baseball team. I think the Yankees. Anyway. Oh, damn. So they, they always comment that when they see those blooming. So if they bloom really early, that, you know, they know it. So I decided to plant my saffron crocus the last time kind of around that same area in front, so it would come up and bloom in the fall, and they would either think that they had missed winter, or B, that I had magical powers of gardening that they didn't know about. <laughs> um, I don't even know what to say to that. You're just always, like, pulling practical jokes on people. So anyway, they never said a thing. And I, the, the thing is, the saffron crocus, they don't always return reliably for me the way other ones do. So it's kind of a novelty thing to grow, but it's fun. That is fun. You know what? That's the thing about gardening is that you can do it any way you want to do it. And anything that pleases you, you can give it a try as long as it isn't invasive in your area. Or illegal. Or illegal. But anymore, what's illegal? So I have, I have some more advice for people if they're going to plant crocuses in their lawn. And I, okay. talk, I have several talks I talk about this. 
So first of all, you cannot use herbicides when you plant crocuses in your lawn because the herbicides will kill the crocuses. So no herbicides. This means you have to tolerate dandelions, plantain, clover, and other uh, wild plants that will show up in your lawn. Which are pretty, so just don't worry about them. Right, and the dandelion is an early nectar source for bees. Yeah, so don't spray pesticides either. Right. And then the other thing is you have to um, wait as long as you possibly can stand it before you mow because you want the foliage to ripen and start to die back before you mow it off. So it looks a little bit rough after it's bloomed, but not for too long. Just pretend you have an English meadow. There you go. And the third thing is you can't uh, water that area of lawn extensively all summer long. I, You know, if, you ha- if you're one of those people that cannot stand for your lawn to go the least bit brown and you're watering every other day, you're probably going to kill off the crocuses from rot because remember where they're, the region that they're from is the Mediterranean region. They don't get that summer moisture like that, and so it will rot them. So don't overwater your lawn. I mean, you can water if there's a drought and you think you're going to lose your lawn. But That would be Oklahoma every summer. So don't get worried about the watering. <laughs> Yeah, don't worry about the watering. Those are all really good pieces of advice. And again, why I don't grow crocuses in my lawn anymore. Because I do have to water my fescue lawn. Oh, and then the other thing. um, Then I also plant, we talked last week about Gloria of the Snow, which is Conodoxa. I'm also naturalizing those on the lawn. But that's another story. Let's move on to veggies. Okay, let's do. So we got a quote for veggies. You want me to do the quote? Yes. Dreams are the seeds of change. Nothing ever grows without a seed, and nothing ever changes without a dream. Debbie Boone. That's nice. Pat Boone's daughter. Which, Yay. When you and I were very young, she had a song out that was, I don't know, it was like You Light Up My Life or something, and it, it went on for so long, and it wore me out. And that all right, veggies. got sung at all the weddings then. Oh, my gosh. It was on the radio everywhere. It was in weddings. It was like, oh, my gosh, make it stop, even though she sang it really well. So we're going to talk today about storing leftover seeds. Right. And I, you know, I have packets of leftover seeds, and some years I'm embarrassed to say that I don't end up using them. But you can safely store leftover seeds, and they will still be viable and germinate the next spring. And so I looked this up so we would have a source but uh, many cooperative extension services have guides, and I just happen to choose Mississippi State for no particular reason. But the mm-hmm. key is to keep the seeds cool and dry, which is around 40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a refrigerator, basically. Right. So some people keep them in the fridge. And put them in an airtight container because the thing that will wreck them more than anything is moisture because then they'll either mold or they're prematurely sprout. And so if you have those little packets of silica gel that come anytime you buy a new pair of shoes, a new purse, you know, everything you buy seems like they put those silica gel packets, but they Mm -hmm. absorb moisture. So if you throw a couple of those packets in the box with the seeds, it'll help absorb moisture. So you're less likely to end up with a rotted bunch of seeds the next year. Well, that's a good idea. The silica, for those who don't realize what silica gel is or silica, the little beads it's that little packet in things that says do not eat this exactly and don't open the packet and sprinkle it around the seeds leave it in the packet leave it in the packet but you know if you store the seeds in the cool dry conditions i mean some of them will last four or five years tomatoes will last four years spinach five years so you know if you um buy a lot of seeds like we do Saving them and then re-sowing them the next year is a great idea. Or um, especially if you're like, I don't end up ever sharing seeds with anybody, and I should. I should contact people and say, hey, I got this packet of tomato seeds, and I only need like five, and I have like 500. <laughs> so Yeah, exactly. Um, also, I was thinking about how you can collect, dry, and store seeds from your own garden. You can. And you can do it from your vegetable garden. Or in my case, I don't usually save the seeds for my vegetable garden because the only thing I would want to save seed from 
that's open pollinated might be my tomatoes. Right. And then I grow so many tomatoes that they probably cross pollinate. And I don't know. I think I'll just buy the tomatoes from the tomato man's daughter up in Tulsa because she actually saves all that seed and makes it better and better for Oklahoma. So that's what I plan to do. But I do save wildflower seeds. Right. And before we go to wildflower seeds, let me tell you, if you decide to save your tomato seeds, the thing about tomato seeds is they've got that gel-like substance around them, right? which actually right. kind of protects them. And so you really need to get that gel substance off of them, and then you've got to dry them really well. And I've dried them on paper plates and stuff. Um, so that's not the easiest seed in the world to save. No, because you have to get them to kind of ferment first. I wrote all this for my book, when, you know, the 2030-something garden guide. And you have to get them to kind of ferment first, and then that separates that gel from them. And then you take them and rinse them off, and then you say, let's put it this way, I'm not saving them. That's right. But we are both saving flower seeds. Right, because I'm making, I haven't told you about this, but I'm, I've decided that my bees don't have enough forage. So I have decided to make a bee meadow in my upper pasture, I am on, I, for our listeners, I live on seven and a half acres. I, I grow about an acre and a half of garden, um, and that's both perennial gardens and vegetable gardens. But my upper pasture, I've never really done a lot with. I've just let it kind of naturally do its thing, and then I mow a path around it. Well, Bill and I decided that we are definitely going to make this meadow. So I've been saving seeds from all of my unusual varieties, like my Henry Eiler's sweet comb flower and, you know, my tall coreopsis and some other things that I've grown this year. I'm saving all those seeds. In fact, I'm looking to the right and on a paper towel, I'll take a picture of this for our story. I have a whole bunch of seeds that I pulled off from some things that I'm saving. Joe pie weed, a bunch of things. So in addition to buying seeds, which are quite expensive, let me tell you, I'm also saving my own seeds because a lot of my garden is very prairie oriented anymore um, because as I get older, it's easier for me to take care of it. And plus it's good for pollinators. Right. And I'm just saving seeds from zinnias and columbine, but I never expect them to be the same color the next year. Right. And do you want to explain that, why they wouldn't be the same colors? Well, they're cross pollinating with one another. And so it's kind of like what the seed is a cross between the two parents and so you're never sure what you're exactly going to get. So if you're the kind of gardener that wants to know exactly what you're going to get, go buy the seeds mm-hmm. from a reputable seed place. Right, and there's a bunch of them. Here's a tip. If you wanted to buy seeds on sale this fall because they're clearing out their quote-unquote 2019 seeds, they and you stored them in your refrigerator and kept them dry, they would be just fine in the spring, and you would get, you'd save a lot. Yeah, they should be much Well, they're going to be much cheaper, and they should work just fine, especially zinnias. I mean, zinnias are not hard to germinate. And if you also, one more thing, if you want to know in the spring if your seeds did save correctly, all you have to do is get a moist paper towel. I'm not talking wet. I'm talking you wring it out, and then you put a couple of seeds from some you've saved in that paper towel of a particular variety and make sure you label the paper towel somehow underneath it or on a plate or something. And then you just fold it over and let it sit for like a day or two, maybe longer for some other seeds, but usually a day or two up to a week. Um, It will germinate and then you'll know for sure if those seeds worked. Plus we should also talk about how um, some seeds should be planted now for some flowers. And so that might not be a bad idea to buy some of those sale seeds for things you might want to plant now, like poppies. Poppies are a good example. Um, Delphiniums. uh, There's a lot of different things you can do right now in October in my climate. What about yours? A little bit later, but it's, it's all about winter sowing and fall sowing, and we should do a whole, we should do that next week. Okay, we'll do a whole thing on that next week. Yeah, winter sowing, because that's kind of a, yeah, we'll do that next week. That'll be our teaser, okay. D. Sorry, that's our teaser. Okay. Onward. Oh, let's talk about our dirt. You do the quote this time because it's from one of our favorite writers. We've already talked about her. Everyone must take time to sit and watch the leaves turn. Elizabeth Lawrence. That's one of my favorite quotes of hers because sometimes as gardeners, we forget to just enjoy the garden, to go sit in it and watch the butterflies. The whole entire time we've been recording this podcast, There have been two monarchs out here just frolicking 
outside my window. And I've got to remember to go out there today and just sit and look at them. Sometimes I take pictures, sometimes I don't. Because I forget to do that. And that's why I always tell people in my talks to make sure you have a place to sit because you need to take a rest sometimes and not worry so much about the weeds. And so our two pieces of dirt this week have to do with that. Right. And you found a neat book when we were in Utah. I did when we were at that garden. Was it the Red Butte Gardens? Yes. At yeah, the University we were, of Utah. Which I've got to say, if you get a chance to go there, that was one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. And it's not that big. Um, the book I saw on a stand in their gift shop, and it was called Forest Therapy. It's by Sarah Ivins. And so it this book starts out with all four seasons and how to enjoy nature in all four seasons. And it has lots of different ways, and the fall section is particularly nice. In the United States, it is really, really hot in the summertime most places. And so at least in the Midwest and in Oklahoma, both, it's hot. So maybe you don't want to get out there and walk through a forest. But in the fall, it's the perfect time. So that's one of the things she tells you to do. It also has projects for the whole family. It is a cute little book. And I, when I got back, I found out about a book that has just been published by the Indiana Native Plant Society called Wake Up Woods. It's by Michael Hamoya, who used to be, our, I think, our state botanist. Shane Gibson, and illustrated by Jillian Harris. And the illustrations are just adorable. And it's a book for kids, and I would say kids to be read by adults with them, that shows all the spring wildflowers and talks about all the little critters in the woods that are associated with the wildflowers. And it's very, very neat. I'm I'm looking at it right now on Amazon while you're talking, and oh my goodness, I'm going to have to have that. So I actually have two more. I bought it at the local bookstore, uh, Wild Geese Books down in Franklin. And I looked at it in the store and I says, okay, get me two more. I'm going to get them for my great nieces and nephew uh, for Christmas. That is so cool. Or maybe I Easter. Love it. Yeah, it would be so cute for Easter. And I was hoping, you know, that maybe this could be a series because they could have a go to sleep woods. And all kinds of things, all kinds of themes for each season. They could also expand it from woods to be like the prairie. Oh, yeah. To wake up oh, prairie. Yeah. Or they could talk about migratory animals and migratory butterflies and how that all happens in the fall. Because that's why we're seeing monarchs in Oklahoma is that the cold front came through and they rode on the cold front. And so I've still got some in my garden flitting around along with a lot of other butterflies. But birds do that too, and other insects like dragonflies. And it's uh, Wake Up Woods, even though it's written by an Indiana author, I think that it would apply to many, many people. The flowers seem to be fairly universal. So that's a great gift idea for kids. That's a beautiful gift idea. Thank you for sharing it. You're welcome. And that's our dirt, Dee. Well, that's all, everyone. Thank you so much for coming and chatting with us over the garden fence. You can reach us at all of the places where good podcasts are found. And we also will link to our uh, BuzzFeed access if you want to listen to us on the computer. We have listeners everywhere. You can also reach us on Facebook, Instagram. And under both of those, you can reach us personally at our various pages. And you can also reach us at the Garden Angelus. You can email us your questions at thegardenangelist at gmail.com. And we're also on Twitter. And I don't think I've forgotten anything, have I? No, and I'll put links to all that in our show notes, which show up on Buzzsprout and also on iTunes. And if you listen on iTunes and you want to give us a review, we would love that. It helps us get found by other people. And we think that they might enjoy our talking about gardening. We hope so. If you enjoy our talking about gardening, give us a five-star review. We'd appreciate it. And by the way, I think I said BuzzFeed instead of Buzzsprout. You don't want to find us on BuzzFeed, and I won't even go there. There you go. All right, Dee, it was great chatting with you over the garden gate today. You too, and I just felt like Elizabeth Lawrence was with us today. I did too. Bye now. Bye.